will be recorded. Thank you for joining the City of Kingston's Common Council at our Special Housing Committee meeting. Today is Wednesday, uh, Thursday, September 24th. My name is Andrew Schott, the Council President and Organizer for our virtual meetings. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few guidelines to help us navigate the system as efficiently and respectfully as possible. We ask that members of the public and press remain muted and off camera for the length of the meeting. As organizer, I reserve the right to mute anyone who unmutes themselves. Council members and city staff will control their own mute button. Good practice would be to mute yourself if you're not speaking to avoid background noise and feedback. If a council member or staff wishes to speak, they will raise their hands. The chairperson will call on them before they speak by stating their name clearly for our audio listeners. All of our meetings are recorded. Both video and written transcriptions will be made available to the public on the city's website. Although we will not have public speaking tonight, you can sign up to speak at our council meeting by emailing Elisa Tinty at emtinty at kingston-ny.gov by 2 p.m. on October 6th. Or you could submit written comments to emtinty at kingston-ny.gov or by dropping them off at the drop box located outside the side door of City Hall. We also encourage you to reach out to committee chairs or your ward representative at any time. If you have any audio issues, send a text message to the following number, 845-594-6120. Please note that phone calls will not be answered during the meeting. The number again to text is 845-594-6120. As the organizer, I reserve the right to lock and pause the meeting to eject anyone who has behaved inappropriately. Lastly, at tonight's meeting, we have an attendance chair, Alderman Rennie Scott Childress, committee member, Alderman Don Tollerman. Thank you for your patience during these difficult times and on behalf of the Common Council, I wish you and your family good health. I now turn the floor over to Chair Rennie Scott Childress. Thank you very much, President Schott. Rennie Scott Childress here. Uh, tonight we have two things uh, on the agenda. Uh, the first is to talk about uh, zoning reform in the city of Kingston, something that uh, some of us believe we desperately need here. The other item is uh, looking a little bit more at the short-term regulation, uh, short-term rental regulations, uh, potential for developing some uh, legislation relating to that. So uh, we're gonna start by talking about uh, zoning. Crucial thing in terms of zoning is that uh, New York State requires that cities develop a comprehensive plan. And then after developing that comprehensive plan, which lays out basically goals, ideals, um, ways of thinking about uh, progress for a, a town or city, a municipality, then the municipality is supposed to develop a zoning plan that corresponds to that um, a comprehensive plan. In the city of Kingston, anyone who's tried to build much of anything, uh, they've realized that we have a whole series of different kinds of zoning uh, issues. We have many different kinds of zones listed. Some of them seem to be uh, redundant, two or three different ones that are for single family housing. We've got a number of overlays, which means that you have a different zone on top of another set of zones. And some of these uh, are confusingly uh, described. They're also rooted in a long history of zoning that raises uncomfortable issues in the United States of America. The uncomfortable issues have to do with creating racial segregation without calling it segregation. And in the early days of zoning, anybody who's read the book, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, you understand that zoning was one of the ways that cities, particularly in the North, created different areas of poverty and wealth, white and black populations. And often black populations, poor populations were pushed by zoning rules toward the areas that were polluted, areas that were otherwise unwanted. So looking at zoning is not simply a question of economic development or building development. It's also a question of equity. It's a question of um, creating a more united 
community in which everybody works truly together. So we're looking at zoning with all of these different things in mind. This is coming up in particular too, because uh, Mayor Noble had created a zoning task force. Um, I believe it was last year when it was created. And the idea was to find a, um, uh, a uh, provider reforming the zoning plan of the city of Kingston to streamline it, make it simpler, make it easier to use, make it clearer, and uh, include these other elements that I mentioned a few minutes ago. The uh, unfortunate thing is that uh, as we were talking about uh, hiring the consultant at the beginning of this year, the COVID crisis hit and that derailed anything that had to do with spending money. So we're wanting to return to this to look at the need for zoning reform. And tonight we're fortunate to be joined by Anthony Tampone, who was one of the members of the task force. We're not going to be talking specifically about the, uh, the consultant. We want to get first a clear uh, groundwork, clear foundation for understanding what uh, the zoning reform would be doing, what it's responding to, and how it would relate to our current city comprehensive plan, and perhaps even suggest the possibility of going toward a new comprehensive plan, given that the current one we have is supposedly only valid for us for another five years, given that it took two or three years to get the other one in place uh, that was done around 2014, 2015, uh, it might behoove us to look into actually thinking about this second revised comprehensive plan. With that said, uh, Anthony, are you there? Did you get Sophia fed? Or do you want me to blather on a little more? I could also invite Don to blather. Oh, can you hear me now? I'm yes, trying can to uh, uh, sh oh, share my... There you go. Can you hear and see me now? Uh, there we go. Now we see you. Okay. All right. So oh, I'm here with... Uh, and, uh, Sophia. Sophia. <laughs> yeah. Um, you say so hello? first off, I'm wondering, Anthony, if you could just give us some of the background of the task mm -hmm. force, uh, you know, sure. what it was meant to do and how it came together. Yeah. So uh, the task force came together as a result of the 2025 comp plan. Uh, we, Steve Noble organized it at the beginning of last year. Um, I think our first meeting was probably February ish. I could be wrong about that, but you know, rough, roughly might maybe March um, of last year. And, uh, and what we were tasked with doing was coming up with an RFP to try to search out for um, a consultant that would be able to work with the city and um, really take, look at the land use planning um, goals that we have as a community uh, in a very comprehensive way and help us re redevelop a, a plan to what originally came out with as uh, uh, rezoning you know the whole the whole original name of the plan was rezone Kingston um, and as we discuss as we research and discuss the whole project um, you know a lot of us have we come to think that the idea is no longer to even use or uh, understand it as zoning, but instead of just land use and planning regulations and more like an urban planning um, type of document, because uh, as Ronnie, you had mentioned, you know, when you look at the historical usage of zoning as a whole in the United States, the, the concept is, is a uh, very, <laughs> very much uh, creating a negative impact to specifically uh, poor and uh, and often uh, along racial lines uh, in not just our community but all kinds of communities. Sophia, I know you need some attention right now, but Daddy no, needs a couple I don't minutes. Need any okay, so I need you to say, can you? Just, I'm just, I'm just playing. Okay, can you play over there for just a couple minutes? Okay, all right. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so. Um, so what we did, Sophia, I really need a couple of minutes here, little one, okay? Just a couple of minutes. Okay. Go run over here. Run over there real quick. Real quick. Um, so what we did was start off by going over the 2025 plan um, in very, very fine detail. 
and <laughs> I apologize. If I hold her, maybe it'll be better. <laughs> okay. Um, so we started going through the 2025 plan in very fine detail, along with uh, a lot of other documents that both the 2025 plan was based on, um, and uh, that other projects that are working co coinciding with. Uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of different projects. I'm sorry, I'm just, I haven't, haven't reviewed my notes in a while. Um, we put this down at the beginning of the year when COVID happened, but um, uh, projects that addressed zoning in a very piecemealed way, like trying, you know, that's one of the reasons why all these different overlay districts exist in in the city and why the the process is very, very inefficient. Um, just give me one, give me one second to try to put her down. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sophia, Sophia, I need to get Remember, Daddy said that I need a couple minutes of. Well, guys, this is hard for me to uh, focus. Um, can I give you some books? It's really important that I need just a minute, okay? Really important, okay? I'll give you some books. Here's your books and your stickers, Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there is no child care right now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm by myself with her. Um, uh, the crazy COVID world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she spent a lot of time. We traveled uh, from New Hampshire this morning. So she spent uh, a lot of time in the car today. So, <laughs> um, uh, so our... Uh, collect my thoughts here. Um, Sophia, come inside with me. Uh, so our... As we looked at the existing zoning, and I know, um, you know, Tony can speak in, in really good depth of like how poor the existing zoning um, like system is in the city of Kingston, how many people have to go in front of. I apologize. I can. She really needs attention right now. And it's, let me try to turn on a television for her. So, um, what other one? I'm going to put that. Would it, be, would, it, would it be helpful to, be, to start the uh, to go agenda item? And yeah, give you like I can, 15, I can, 20 minutes? I can give you my attention in like two minutes. I just have to put her in front of a television, which I hate to do, but if I do that, I'll be able to. If you guys have something else to talk about for like two minutes, yeah, or five, or however about. long it takes. Yeah. We're, we're elected officials. We always have something to talk about. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself and uh, and I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, maybe we don't have anything to talk about, but we could talk. Yeah. Well, uh, we do. I um, in terms of short-term rental regulation, I have uh, written um, uh, Dennis Doyle for the latest uh, numbers relating to short-term rental regulation, but I haven't gotten anything back from him. Uh, we also got two different um, uh, pieces of correspondence relating to it. Uh, one was uh, someone who owns a building that has several, um, uh, I think it's four units of um, uh, uh, short-term rental units with no other units in it. And she had questions. And so those are things that we can address. The... Um, and, and what what her letter underscores is the need to be very clear about why we're looking at any particular element of short-term rental regulation. The other uh, piece was interesting. Uh, the other letter from Karen Winkle-Gorsline was interesting because she was wondering about how short-term rental regulation might um, interact or interface with uh, thinking about uh, some of the housing problems that we have. So there's quite a number of people in uh, the area who are looking for low-income housing, other forms of housing, uh, but there's a huge backlog. And, and so before even, you know, the COVID crisis hit, this was already a big problem. So I think that would be a really fascinating uh, angle for us to look at uh, more in depth. Um, so... Uh, we can talk about that more, of course, in a little bit if uh, Anthony's back and unencumbered. Yes. Sorry. Um, got her in front okay. of the show. Uh, so one of the things that we actually have put as part of our RFP and the things that we want to uh, uh, address with the land use planning regulations that, w that work, you know, uh, 
when this whole process goes through is handling short-term uh, rental, the short-term rental pro problem um, and with specific advice from the consultant. And we, and I know we're not going to get into the details of the consultant right now, but we did specifically discuss with both our consultants uh, what methods to handle that exact particular problem. Um, being, you know, addressing the challenges that short-term rentals are pulling away from you know, like long-term permanent uh, tenancies and you know how that affects the market and available inventory uh, in different ways to address that. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, I think it's very important to address it probably before all of this stuff can be implemented, especially being that the timeline is gonna be pushed out. Uh, no, no matter how quickly we can move forward with this, especially with the COVID situation, this, uh, the land use planning is going to take a lot of community engagement and that is going to be a very specific challenge with, um, you know, with COVID and, and, you know, the traditional means that are used to gather community input obviously can't be, can't be done in the way that we really want to get that kind of engagement. Um, so I don't know how that would move forward. You know, I, you know, I haven't spoken to the consultant at all since this has happened. You know, our last conversation was, I, I think like February, like just like a week before you guys voted on it. And, um, uh, in, um, uh, I think your finance committee committee, right. I think that's, that's where it let last, mm -hmm. last got addressed. Yeah. Um, Anthony, what's, what's, the so, distinction? Anthony, what's, the, what's the distinction with land use versus uh, zoning overall? Well, so, uh, it's really just a terminology issue, but the word zoning, um, specifies that this goes here and that goes there and uh you know we we were pretty blunt in the original um uh preamble that we wrote for the rfp that ended up getting not going out with the with the document but um really trying to address uh, uh social economic and racial discrepancies and disparities that were created maybe purposefully, maybe not, like through this process and making sure that they were addressed. And the word zoning in itself says you people that aren't, that we don't want go in this space. Um, but what it really is, is land use planning, you know, and the, and the state doesn't stipul stipulate um, a z that zoning is a thing. Uh, they say that uh, land use regulation can be implemented by a municipality in conjunction with a well-organized plan. In our case, the comprehensive plan, you know, whatever we end up calling it. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be called zoning, you know? And so it's, it's, it's really a frame of mind, um, but you know, what it is, is land use planning, you know? So it, you know, think about it from an urban planning point of view, not uh, draw lines and put things in these, in these spaces because that's specifically what we don't want to do. And it's what happened with the concept of urban renewal and, and everything that kind of created this problem over the last 60, 70 years, you know? Um, Anthony, so you we, about, did you uh, interview with the consultants or was that, that just the mayor doing that? No, no, we, we, we interviewed the consultants as a group, yeah. And how many consultants did you see? We saw two. Um, we got four proposals. Um, we reviewed their paper propo proposals. After that, there were only two consultants that were qualified to do the type of work that we wanted to do and brought both of them in for interviews. Uh, we did um, some reference checks on them. We spoke to them on the phone, uh, had a couple of emails back and forth, and then, and then brought them in for uh, interviews. Uh, and that was in front of the but that it was that was part of the whole, whole group. Yeah. The one who came in second place were, were they um, uh, similar in price or much different in price? Uh, the the one that came in second was cheaper, but th they they didn't quite do what we asked them to do in the way that we lined it out. They didn't follow the RFP very. Uh, we asked for a number of things. They were capable of doing those things and they said and they sent us a package that said here's the basic things that we we do and all the things that you want are a la carte extras so i think when we actually added it up they were almost the same or maybe more expensive for less stuff for the people that came in second um but you know uh as you know we 
we all kind of like, you know, threw numbers on a piece of paper to try to see what it was going to end up costing because obviously none of us had any idea what it was going to cost. Um, and, you know, we're maybe a little bit surprised, but when you really think about how in depth the work needs to be, how long it's going to take, it, it really, uh, to me, it seems like a, a value proposition. And, you know, if I had my druthers, I would actually want them to do more work and therefore reducing the amount of work that the city has to do on a piecemeal basis. You know, every single project that goes on in the city needs a consultant, needs an engineer hired. You know, every single one of those projects costs money. And so like if we're doing a street, streets to work project in this place, maybe there's a little bit of grant money to, to, to pay for that. Or we're doing, you know, something like the Broadway streetscape project. You know, there's like some things that do that, but all there's a lot of that process that is repeated every single time because of the stipulations of however the grant money is or where the funding is coming from. And by having really well-defined land use planning guidelines, then most of that work is already laid out. And it's just a matter of figuring out how it works in the broader plan in this specific spot. So even if that consultant, you know, or engineer, whoever is doing that particular project, they're still going to have to be there. But the amount of work they have to do is less because they don't have to reinvent a lot of the concepts because they'll be laid out in a really well-developed plan. So, Anthony, right. what's the, you know, you're talking about getting community engagement. Can you yeah. give us a sense of, of, you know, what the community engagement would entail? So uh, a lot of community outreach, um, being at every major event for a couple of weeks or a month, you know, or two in, in the community, uh, trying to, uh, they have different methods of, of the way that they, they, they uh, are going to, that they plan to do it, but it's pretty comprehensive getting into uh, all different types of uh, community organizations in order to get feedback, make sure that the word is out, people understand uh, like, uh, what's going on in their community, what might change in their community, how to give them about uh, like information gathering in these types of situations is fantastic. Um, you know, watching and speaking to some other municipalities that have already worked with, and it's not just this consultant. I mean, they all do this pretty relatively well, but the one that we chose seems to do it incredibly well is gather all this data and, uh, and put it together in a way that allows you to like sort through what the feeling of the community really is. Um, but, you know, everything from uh, the farmer's market to spiritual gatherings to, um, you know, every, every like little hangout that happens in the city, they'll reach people out there and try to get the word out for people to get together um, to a number of different events that they'll put together uh, in order to gather community input. You know, we've all been to similar things where they draw, but there's a bunch of maps on tables all over the place and people draw things and say, you know, this is a problem I feel about here. This is this thing here, um, you know, like really gather information from the community. But as the consultants, they will have a team of people at every single one of these events are speaking with all the citizens that are there. They are like they're trained to understand when somebody complains about like maybe the way a street is like understand about why it may be like that and what you know or the way that the house is on this block or maybe the way that they are and and you know issues along those lines and, and complaints about uh, the kind of apartment that they live in or how challenging it is to be in this neighborhood for whatever reason like they understand what the real um structural issues are that create those problems and and can use it you know and and the way that they talked about that was really um pretty impressive um so is there a uh ad going on right now <laughs> all right that's how we're paying for city government these days i guess <laughs> um so uh, then is land use, is that um, a synonym for form-based code or is form-based code simply one approach of land use planning in the way that you're talking about it? Yeah, so uh, so form-based code is the concept that we, there are some allusions to wanting to go to that in the 2025 plan, but, um, you know, the 2025 plan is very, very contradictory. Um, you, you had mentioned and uh, about that it needs to get rewritten. Um, 
you know, it's only good for, I think, 10 years, maybe 15 years. I can't remember. But um, uh, there, there is a little bit of talk about using form-based code. Uh, the concept of form-based code is that instead of drawing lines based on what things y are used for, they br it broadens the usage and draws lines based on the architectural elements and feelings of a neighborhood, right? So uh, this, right? If we had form-based code in, uh, you know, in this city as it exists right now, things like uh, the the Walgreens would not exist or look anything like it does. Uh, the the Eckerd's or whatever it is would not look at where you know where the old trailways building was. That would not be the way that it that it looks, right? You would have all the buildings on Broadway are are uh, like stone constructed buildings with buildings right up against the the sidewalk and if there's parking that's needed that's in the back of the building if a building needs to get re knocked down and rebuilt it would have to look like it belongs in the neighborhood you know and like that's the concept of form based code is that you're looking at the feel of a place and especially in a place as historic as our city is it's really important to to keep those elements because that's what gives a community a certain feeling Right. If not, then, you know, every place could just be like, you know, cookie cutter suburbia and it all looks and feels the same, you know, but the 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 feeling of the way of of our city is really rooted in like historical and architectural elements here. Um, and the form based code focuses on preserving that. Uh, it also looks at neighborhoods as they're built. Right. So. Uptown Kingston is a perfect example. Right where I am in my house, uh, like my garage sits on my property line. Right now, I couldn't build that. Every garage in my entire neighborhood sits on their property line. None of them are legal based on current code. Every single one of them is pre-existing non-conforming. There's no reason to have pre-existing non-conforming. We should just make the code fit what's already here, you know, so that we don't have to, like, let's say uh, I have to do some type of a modification to my garage. I have to go in front of the ZBA. I have to ask for a zoning variance to make a small change to a property that has been like this since 1902. You know, like it doesn't make sense that those are things that we have to do and have to go and create all that bureaucratic red tape just to make the neighborhood look like it already does. You know, um, so and especially as neighbor, you know, as infant fill development happens, as neighborhoods change, which is inevitable, right? We want to allow it to change, but still allow it to feel like the space that it is, you know, the space that it's been uh, and all those things that make our city great. Um, and one of the things that uh, by focusing on the form instead of the use, which is the way current, uh, you know, urban renewal zoning, you know, as it is basically used throughout the United States, focuses on use and not the way things, not very little the way things look. They're designed on making sure that there's lots of space around uh, a single family home and that everything else uh, can get jammed up together in a spot that's somewhere else. Right. Um, but what we would like is for most of those uses to be able to be almost anywhere in the city, unless it's something that's particularly nuisanceful, like an industrial smelting plant or something like that, right? Like, all right, you know, that's something that's going to need a particular type of, uh, uh, you know, look if, if that type of thing was going to be allowed. But if you want to have a photography studio in the access apartment that you have in your house, that shouldn't necessarily be illegal, but it is right now. Like, um, you know, if you wanted to have some crafts and you had a couple of people like live work type of situations, is against the law in almost all the spaces in the city of Kingston, unless you're in a particular mixed use overlay district. So certain parts of Broadway and, and, and up in certain parts of uptown, you know, I mean, if you look at, if you retake, if you pull the overlay districts out, it's not even legal to live in the stockade district. Like that is a commercial district specifically how Dan Schuster wrote it in 1960, you know, mm -hmm. um, like, you do you're only allowed to live there because of overlay districts you know, um, and, and special uses. None of that makes any sense that we want people to live and work in similar places. We want people to be able to, uh, like have a bodega down the street from their house where they can go right now. Like a bodega is not legal in most places in the city, you know? So it's like, why are those types of things 
the way that they are when that's not how the city traditionally was and that's not how a, a city of community is if the bodega looks nice looks like it belongs there why not let it be there yeah that's one of the things that really stands out from the yeah. um uh a lost Rondell documentary. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of smaller shops around so people could do a lot of their, you know, various, they could meet a lot of their needs by walking there without having to take a long drive or something like that or take public transportation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, a perfect example of this is right up the street from there. I think on Pierpont, uh, there, there, somebody was trying to put a coffee shop in recently and, the truth that was just going through when COVID started. I'm not sure if that actually happened or not. Um, but uh, so there's no parking there. That place, the spot that they were trying to go into 70 years ago was a cafe. Like that's what it was. It was, that's what it was supposed to be. And now like because of parking requirements, that is an issue, but most people are not parking there. They're walking there, you know, and that's the kind of community that we want. So why are we telling someone that they can't operate a business downstairs from their apartment in a, in a neighborhood that could support the neighborhood when, um, because our zoning is telling us that you need to have X amount of parking spaces, uh, just in order, in order to be able to have, have a, have a business. If people can't park there, people aren't going to go there. The business might not survive, you know, and if that's a risk that somebody wants to take, and that's the risk of opening a business. Like, but as a municipality, like it seems ridiculous to to need to have those types of requirements. You know, those requirements were put in there because they wanted to sell Chevys. You know, <laughs> like not because they wanted to have community. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah, great. Um, let's see, uh, Don. Any other questions? Um, we have to have a nice way of uh, communicating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Problems with our code. Um, yeah. uh, one of the challenges we face um, in drafting, in, in pushing forward with this, is it's a tremendous cost for the city. Mm -hmm. um, and most people don't really grasp um, the importance of it. Um, however, if we could say, you know, not redoing our code costs our city tremendously, you know, we uh pay. Every every time something comes up, but even but what I heard from you that I hadn't considered of, it really costs us in terms of our our local community based economy. If you can't have a photographer work a photographer in his garage, you know, then he's not going to even buy a house or even come to our city. So there's a lot of intangible costs that we pay by having archaic code um, and. Uh, so I think when we do revisit this, it's important to try to capture some of these anecdotes. And that, you know, when, when, we, when we talk about this, it's so great to have little examples that people can understand and relate to, like a photography studio, like a bodega. Um, and uh, so it's really great to hear your... Uh, input yeah i mean to to that i mean if you're thinking about uh the value right the, so the value in, in my point of view and i you know when i got involved in this project i thought about this a little bit and it, mostly because i you know i'm involved in uh, local real estate and housing providing and i see other people moving in and you know there's a lot of you know we all know about the the energy moving up the hudson right and, uh, and, and new investments and things that are happening here and everybody's concerned about gentrification and, and, and bigger changes to the community. And you, having comprehensive land use planning is a really good way to make sure that uh, the, the money and energy that's coming into the community doesn't create a community that we don't want. It creates the community that we do want because it, it tells people, sure, come live here, invest here, but this is the way that our community operates and this is the way that it looks and this is the way that it feels and you are welcome to, to be part of it as long as you actually are part of it and not trying to make it something that it's not, you know? And it's really, it, it's difficult 
right now to say that something isn't. And part of the issues in, um, uh, you know, uh, corporation council, I'm sure can, you know, Dan will say a lot about that. A lot of the zoning that we have right now, I think creates legal loopholes to basically allow people to do things that we don't necessarily ever want them to do, you know, but that's, but, you know, if you've got the money and the attorneys, you can do whatever you want. And a well-developed plan would, would make the city always look the way that we want it to and invite the kind of investments that we want to have in, in, you know, in our community. And time is the biggest cost factor here. You know, um, you know, not only it, it, you, uh, you talk about the lost Ronda movie. I mean, you know, Steven, you will, will, you know, his entire, you know, work has been based on like, what if we thought about this better? you know, um, you know, years ago and the, how much better would our community be if, if we already had this conversation 60 years ago, you know, um, what if, uh, so the original preamble for the RP that went out, um, was a, a work that, um, Stephen, Karen and I put together, uh, it maybe was a little strongly negatively worded about things that are happening right now. It ended up not being part of the official publication. Um, but, the Stephen and I had a conversation about it that was like, if we do our job really well right now, there won't have to be a Stephen Blauweiss in another 25, 30 years. Right? Like no one's going to have to tell the story about how the money and changes that happened in our city ruined our city. Somebody can tell a story about how great our city is, but not how bulldozers destroyed our most, our most precious uh, architectural artifacts poor people go in this block and all the rich people go over here, you know, uh, like that's, that's not the story we want to tell. Um, and, but so we need to make sure that that story isn't the truth. You know, uh, we need to proactively make sure that, uh, that we are a community and, and we keep it that way. And, uh, and, you know, it's, it's an inevitable that more money is coming here. And the sooner that we make sure that we can handle that, the better. Um, my my neighbor and his motorcycle is racing around the block on circles, so I'm going to go inside. <laughs> well, I think that uh, that's great. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any other questions for Anthony. You know, do you any? Um... Yeah, Anthony, I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, you know, uh, I think what uh, you've really uh, emphasized here is the need. Uh, to get more community involvement and how this can be empowering to the community as a way of creating connection and bringing people together. Because I think this has been, you know, my experience in local government is that uh, we tend to kind of lurch towards something and then a lot of folks come out against it without there being a clear idea of, you know, well, how does this fit into the larger picture? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I think that uh, that's that would be the value of uh, it sounds like that the consultant, the job for them would be to actually kind of figure out what the community is in a way, because mm -hmm. they would be talking to lots of different people. You know, so I've been involved in two big issues. One was the almshouse and that brought out one crowd of Kingstonians. Yes. And now the Kingstonian project has brought out a different crowd of Kingstonians and you know, I, I, my experience is that we've got these different groups, different factions in town that don't necessarily speak to each other. So it sounds like this might be a way of actually getting folks to find a kind of, not that they're going to agree, but find a common ground on which they can at least talk through some of their concerns and their, their desires for the city. Yeah, I mean, so the Kingstonian project, I think, is a perfect example of why we need this type of planning, because that if we already had this planning done, uh, all guaranteed, uh, I, you know, Joe and Brad would still want to do that project, right? But they would already know what they need to do to make sure that the project fit within the scope of the things that we want in the city, right? Mm -hmm. So we we can invite those types of investments and not have to go through this constant back and forth. I mean, obviously, something of that scale is still going to need certain types of um, you know, the nuances like figured out, but in a much broader, uh, uh, concept, someone would be able to look at our land use planning document and say, okay, 
this is what a project like that it has to look like. Here are the things that I'm going to have to satisfy for community needs. Uh, like here's the the build and architectural details that I need to make sure that I build to. Uh, they'll under they would be at the place that they are now, and probably I think a, even a little bit different than they are now two years ago, three years ago, because they would approach it already knowing what the needs of the community are. Uh, you know, because those things are already documented, they're already planned out. Um, and, you know, so it, it, it allows, uh, like a large developer to be able to look and say, what do I really need to do to put something in this community? You know, um, and, and what does the community really need from the type of money that I'm looking to invest in, in, in a place? Uh, you know, because, you know, a high rise condo is not a thing that's going to happen here unless it is very, very specifically addressing community needs, you know. Um, you know, and that's a great way. Would, I mean, how much money has the city spent on that, you know, or, already and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and working on other projects? Having a well-developed plan re eliminates a lot of that. It eliminates the overhead in the planning department, like, incredibly. Uh, it eliminates that the, if, if our plan was really well done, there would not have to be ZBA meetings or very, very rarely. Like those lists would be very, very short, um, you know, administrative overhead. When you look at all those things and you put them out over a couple of years, you're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, in, in less time than you think. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to put together those numbers, but I'm sure there's somebody around that could and uh, and could could make it put it together in a way that this project, even spending more money on this project, would actually save the city money in the long run. Anthony, would you be willing to yeah. put together a uh, back of the envelope spreadsheet with me, like sure. um, just broad strokes as a start? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, for sure. Uh, you know, it, 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 when it comes to municipal work. Uh, you know, it always blows my mind how much more something costs. So, like, you know, anything, any any amount of effort that you can reduce from from happening, uh, you know, is saving the taxpayers in the community, uh, you know, both stress and money. So, uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that spreadsheet will add up really fast. So, so let's let's do, let's do that, and I'm sure people okay. will do it. But at least we'll have a piece of paper that said that says this is what it costs if we don't do our zoning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, even just with the photos of like, you know, uh, the non-tangible costs, like, you know, what is the cost of, uh, of, you know, the big bubble laundromat and, and like Eckerd's and stuff on, on Broadway and other places looking like that and continuing for like those types of things that are, that will happen as time goes on instead of having beautiful architectural buildings in those spaces that make people, want to be here because it's a better looking and feeling community you know people feel better about where they live when it looks great um you know not everybody wants a starbucks on every corner but you know that's what happens to most cities when they don't pay attention to what's happening great, great. yeah so, that's uh, wonderful thank you so much anthony we appreciate yeah. it and uh tell sophia she's welcome to join any meeting anytime <laughs> as far as i'm concerned I All certainly right. will. Thank you. We look really forward to talking to you about this some more here in the near future. Okay. Great. Thank you. Again. All right. Uh, so, Don, um, there's also on the docket here short term rental issues, regulations. Uh, do you want to talk about that some now? Uh, or do you feel like we need to um, pin down uh, some of those details? Because like I said, I don't know if you heard, but I wrote to Dennis Doyle uh, for the latest figures in terms of uh, short-term rentals and those sorts of things, but I haven't heard back from him yet. Well, Rennie, I read, I read the notes that we took from our last discussion of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, another important document is Dennis Doyle's um, um, review on short-term rentals, his original presentation that he did for uh, Ulster County um, planning mm -hmm. um, that had, um, you know, a lot of good information that we um, can review for next month. Um, okay. I think, I think what I, I think what I'd like to do is, is, is task ourselves with, 
either uh, n number one, a go, no go. Do we recommend to the council that we enact short-term legislation? Short -term mental legislation? And I think I think if we said to ourselves, let's decide next month whether we're going to recommend that or not, and, and then from that um, figure out how we will draft that legislation. Um, you know, with corporate counsel and be able to submit a communication to uh, to the council president. What do you think of that? In other words, I, I, I just want to be action oriented and give ourselves a timetable to actually create legislation or not um, on this subject. Uh, well, I think we need a little bit of uh, time in there for public uh, interaction. Uh, but isn't, that, isn't that a good thing to do once we propose legislation so the public can react? to that? Uh, well, that's certainly one approach. The other one is to try to get more people to uh, reflect on the different elements that we've laid out there. Um, so, you know, for example, uh, we got that one letter from someone who had a bunch, who had a number of really good questions about, you know, basically saying, what's the rationale for this question? What's the, what's the data for that question, right? So I hear, I hear you, um, but, and so I'm just coming at it with more of a, you know, um, a, a transactional point of view. Let's, mm -hmm. let's put something out there. And in other words, if it's if it's potential legislation, we're going to get a lot more people weighing in and paying attention at our public hearings, I think. Um, okay. when, when there's an article in the Freeman saying that council looking at um, enacting short-term regulations, I, I, I don't know. That's just my, you know, I'm, I'm still relatively new at this, but that's my experience. That if we actually put forward something in a communication, then it becomes real, and then the conversations become, you know, hot, and then we can decide, make productive decisions, um, rather than just more hearings. But it, you know how I am different, Manny, than I'm, that's how I'm wired to sort of push ahead, you know? Right. Well, I mean, and, you know, another thing is just, uh, it, it's easier to... Um, it's easier to discuss something that's tangible. So if you've yes. got items of legislation, but you know, what we could do uh, would be um, something in between perhaps where we say, we've thought about it. And, you know, on this particular question, here's these two possibilities, you know, where do people come down uh, in there? So they would have somebody to think about, and that would be engaging folks in the question rather than just saying, you know, here's this answer without being clear what the other possibility or possibilities might be. So I'm in favor of that. Um, but if we do that um, approach, do you think that you, that we, you and I could come up with, you know, those two questions to put out to the public? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, even, even over the next two, two weeks or so. Right. Rather than waiting for next month and talking about it again, um, yeah. put something out there. Let's get some, uh, some juices flowing. Okay. I'm I'm good with juice. <laughs> Great. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's do juice, Andrea, not not meat juice. So, Randy, perhaps you and I can um, can schedule something offline on Monday. We can have a conversation about just some questions to put forward to the public. Yeah, um, Monday will work fine. Late afternoon. Okay. Is that okay for you? You think? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, well, that's it then for the official meeting. Um, but uh, so, Don and Andrea, if, if we could talk for just a minute after we close up the meeting. Yes. Just about scheduling. Yep. Yeah. yeah oh, so, you want me to close down the meeting and then now and then stay yeah, on? Yeah. So, we're done. We're done with the official talk of the meeting. Uh, we're going to put together some stuff regarding short term rental regulation possibilities so that we can um, put that out and give people something tangible to look at, you know. Um, and uh, so Don and I are going to meet to do that and then put something out. But uh, we need to talk about, you know, there's the issue of who's going to uh, handle these meetings, uh, whether you can continue to do that or if, if we need to change the time, that sort of thing. So that's what we're going to talk so, about. so you want me to stay on? That's what I was asking. Turn off the yes, recording. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's yeah. all. So, uh, we'll, we can motion to end the meeting and vote. Oh, meeting's over. So, 
uh, that's all the discussion, uh, you know. All right, and, know and for folks listening, uh, we do have to deal with some scheduling. So as soon as we have the new date, it'll be it'll be posted when we figure out the next meeting. But I will 